Welcome everyone. My name is Dana Louise Williams. I am your soul mission mentor here and we have another episode of Evolve Back to Love. And I've got my soul brother Robert Schwartz here who's going to walk us through an amazing adventure that he's had. And I've got both of his books here. These are just the most amazing books. And have I got that? Can, can you see that? Is it, am I putting it in the right way, Rob? For I can see it very, very clearly. Okay, good, good. So, um, Rob, your journey is amazing. And, you know, you and I both have a similar mission where we want, uh, we want everybody on the planet to um, step into a neutral place around the adversities that we came into this life with. And you were gifted with um, uh, 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 your own soul's blueprint that completely changed your life around from the corporate world to here you are, this amazing, you know, <laughs> thought leader, mystic soul brother. And um, let's jump in and, and, and tell everyone, you know, uh, about your amazing journey. And in between all of that, I'd like to just, um, you know, name drop that you're on a tour and you're coming to, uh, you know, different um, countries and different towns in the next uh, bunch of months and into 2019. So I'm really excited about that and I'm going to be attending the one in September that you're doing in Vancouver and I can't wait to uh, to be in that workshop with you. So Rob, let's jump in and you know tell our listeners and our viewers about you know how it all began for you. Well, let me begin just by thanking you for having me on your show. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I also want to mention for your viewers that my website is YourSoulsPlan.com. And if they go to the books pages uh, in the main menu, you can actually read large excerpts from Your Soul's Plan, Your Soul's Gift uh, for free. Uh, so what happened to me is basically what you just said. I was in the corporate world for a number of years. Uh, I have an MBA, which I think is probably unusual for the author of a couple of New Age books. <laughs> and back in 2003... I was working as a self-employed marketing and communications consultant, basically doing different forms of corporate writing. Uh, I did not enjoy this work at all. Uh, it was deeply unfulfilling. I liked the writing aspect, but I didn't like the subject matter that I was writing about. And uh, it was even more than that. You know, I had the feeling that if I were to fall off the face of the earth, none of my clients would even know that I was gone. They would just plug someone else into that role and carry right along. But, you know, I, I also had the distinct feeling that there was a certain calling or a certain purpose to my life. I just didn't know what it was, and I wasn't even sure how to figure out what it was. And so I tried various conventional approaches to resolve this. You could call it an existential crisis. Uh, I tried career counseling. That didn't help at all. Uh, I took the Myers-Briggs inventory, and that was an interesting intellectual exercise, but really it didn't answer the questions I had about what to do with my life. And, you know, I went to all my friends and family and I said, I'm very unfulfilled doing this corporate writing. What do you think I should do with my life? That, by the way, is not a good question to ever ask another person. You know, about half the people literally shrugged their shoulders and said, I don't know. And the other half advised me to do whatever they were doing for a living, which, as you can imagine, was not tremendously helpful. So on May 7th of 2003, I did something that I had never done before. And I remember the date because this was the day on which my life changed. I went to see a psychic meeting. I wasn't even sure that I believed in mediumship, but I thought, you know, why not? I'll spend an hour of my time, a little bit of money, and if nothing comes from it, there's no harm done. So I go into this session with the medium, uh, just open and curious to see what would come up. And she begins to channel my spirit guides. Well, I didn't even know what that was. I've never heard the term spirit guide before. And I said, what is a spirit guide? She said, well, a guide is a highly evolved non-physical being with whom you planned your life before you were born. And now that you're in body, your guides are guiding you through this earth school. And I said, well, uh, what I would like to know is what is my plan? And in particular, why did I plan certain challenges? And I rattled off a few of what the biggest challenges have been. 
So she starts to channel my guides, and they were able to explain in tremendous detail uh, what some of my challenges, uh, what it was all about, you know, why these things had been planned before I was born. And I came out of that session with the medium uh, shell-shocked in some ways. I mean, it really rocked my world. And it was very hard for my uh, analytic mind to accept what I had been told. But on a gut level, on an intuitive level, I could sense the truth in the spirit guide's words. And so I thought about this constantly for weeks afterward. And it had a, a, the effect of creating a deep healing for me. In other words, now I could see the deeper spiritual purpose and meaning of these challenges. And that, in turn, brought about you know, a healing. And so I realized I was onto a concept that could bring a similar kind of healing to other people. And that was when I first started to think about writing a book on mm. the subject. Mm. Nice. Uh, I've got a question for you. Um, there's a lot of people that are going to be uh, tuning in and, and resonating with that feeling that you had when you felt, you know, the dissatisfaction you didn't know what a spirit guide was. You didn't know, you know, you weren't a soul-seeking, you know, person, soul-searching person at that point. Um, but there was a nudge or something that led you to go uh, seek a medium. Um, you know, what would you say to the people now that um, are in that position and haven't read your books and maybe are suffering with adversity you know, because of what they chose it, to come in, in and experience, what would you say to them? I would say, on a regular basis, get quiet in some way. If it's not a formal meditation, go for a walk in the woods, take long drives, mm -hmm. long hot showers, anything that is meditative in quality. Mm -hmm. And allow your mind to go blank. Mm -hmm. uh, pose a question of God, your guides, some spiritual figure of significance to you. And then as you allow your mind to go blank, just see what comes to you. And it's not so much that you're going to hear your guides talk to you, although that is certainly possible. But it's more that in those moments of receptivity, and in those moments where your mind is relatively quiet, it gives your guides and the rest of your spiritual team an opportunity to plant a seed. And that seed may germinate days, weeks, even months down the road. By the time it germinates, you're not going to be able to identify that some great idea has come to you as a result of mm -hmm. a walk or a meditation you did six months earlier. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. Your guides don't need you to give them credit like that. But it will be the case that that seed germinates some months down the road. You'll have some blinding flash of inspiration or insight. You'll just know the answer to the question that you posed, and then you can pick up the ball and run with it. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you for that. I think that's a really good, uh, good, good idea. And um, you know, globally around the planet, there are corporations that are um, that are crumbling because they're on very shaky foundations, and a lot of the corporate, um, you know, uh, the people that are in a corporate career are very dissatisfied. So you know your books, I think, would be a, a really great um, prescription for that, and perhaps you know they'll 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 feel that little nudge, and um, so let's let's continue on with your adventure of how everything you know you started, you know, getting um, kind of like you know your 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 path led you to really want to be inspired to get evidence about what these mediums were bringing forward. I, I did very much want to get evidence, but there's there's another step in there before I got to that stage that I, I want to make sure to mention to your viewers, and that is that within a, a very short time of that session with the medium, I had what is to this day the single most profound spiritual experience I've ever had, and it very much laid the groundwork for the books that I went on to write. Uh, I was home, and this is just a couple weeks after that session, was home in my apartment in Evanston, Illinois, having an average work day. I decided to take a break from work and go for a walk. So I'm walking down the sidewalk in Evanston, and suddenly I was overcome by this feeling of overwhelming unconditional love for every person I saw. And when I say unconditional love in this context, I don't mean the kind of love you might feel for a parent or a child or a romantic partner. 
this was an experience of divine love. It was truly a transcendent experience. Uh, everywhere I looked, every time I saw another person, I felt just pure, overwhelming, unconditional love for them. And although I had never heard about such an experience or read about it, I understood intuitively what was happening, which was, I was in some kind of enhanced, immediate communion with my own soul. So it's as though my soul were saying to me, this love is who you really are. And I believe that my soul gifted me with that experience because later, when I eventually went on to examine many, many people's pre-birth plans for your soul's plan and your soul's gift, every single pre-birth plan I looked at for the books was based on great wisdom and complete unconditional love. And this was true even when a, a quote-unquote negative role was being scripted for someone. So if I had not had that experience, I would still have found the same result in my research. But I think there would always have been this little voice at the back of my head saying, how do you know this is true? How do you know the life plan is always based on unconditional love? Well, I know it because that was my experience walking down the sidewalk that day. I experienced myself, my soul, as limitless, unconditional love. And this is how I know that when I examined people's pre-birth plans and found that they were always based on unconditional love, that's how I know that that's true. Now, in terms of looking for evidence uh, from mediumship, you know, I come from a very conventional background. And when I had the session with the medium and then I had that experience of my soul as unconditional love, those were the things that prompted me to want to write a book about pre-birth planning. But because my background was so conventional, it actually didn't even occur to me for quite some time that there are mediums and channels who can access that kind of information. I spent a number of months uh, posting notices on spirituality bulletin boards on the internet, saying, author, writing a book about how we plan our lives before we're born, if you remember planning your life, please contact me. And I'll tell you, I got thousands of emails from all over the world, and not a single one of those people remembered planning their current lifetime. They were writing in with stories about past lives on Earth, past lives on other planets, non-physical lifetimes, but not a single person remembered planning their current lifetime. And this went on for a period of months. Finally, I began to despair of ever being able to write a book on the subject. And it was at that point that I prayed, and I said, God, if you would like me to write a book about how we plan our lives before we're born, I will. I'll be happy to do it, but I need some help here. I don't know how to research people's pre-birth plans. And wouldn't you know it, within a very short time of making that prayer to the universe, I came into contact with various mediums and channels who, in one form or another, could find out what somebody planned before they were born. So that's the methodology I used to research your soul's plan and your soul's gift. I worked with mediums and channels. Now, since your soul's gift came out, uh, I have become certified as a between lives regression therapist, a hypnotist. And so people will come to me and ask, what is my pre-birth plan? And now the way we get that kind of information is through a between lives soul regression, in which they talk with their guides, they talk with their counsel, and they get answers to questions about their life plan. But when I was writing the books, it was based just on mediumship and channeling. Hmm. And what did you discover about your life's plan? Did, did, um, did you find that blueprint through one of these uh, mediums? You know, I have some information about it. I don't feel that I have the whole story just yet, but what I do know is uh, there were a couple of past lives on Earth that were directly relevant to the plan for my current lifetime, and they're similar in nature. One was uh, I was in Atlantis as an average citizen, apparently, I was opposed to what the Atlantean government was doing, which you might know was some very strange experiments with uh, genetic mutations and things like that. So I was opposed to what was going on, but I didn't speak out against it. I didn't have the courage to. And then the same thing happened in Nazi Germany. I was a German citizen who was opposed to what the Nazis were doing, but I lacked the courage to speak out against them. So apparently when I was planning the current lifetime, I looked at those two lives. I was not very happy that I didn't have the courage to speak my truth. And I decided I want to put myself in circumstances in which uh, it will be challenging to speak my truth. It will require courage of me. And also I wanted the speaking of my truth to be of service to others. So the plan, 
my guides and I came up with is speak this uh, as yet not mainstream truth about pre-birth planning. It will take some courage to do that. Uh, but if you have the courage to do that, it will be of great service to others. And that is essentially what the plan is all about. Mm -hmm. Very nice. And that was uh, 2003, was it? Or, or thereabouts? Ses the session with the medium was 2003. Yeah. So really, think about it. You know, that, I mean, I know myself, I've been uh, working full-time as a healer for uh, 13 years, even though I... You know, I did it before that and, and wasn't professionally working. But, you know, I look back at when I first, you know, started um, working full time. And, you know, 13 years ago, this was not mainstream. It was a little bit on the edge. And, you know, you, you could have easily been ostracized by coming out of the closet and saying, hey, here's my new, here's my new career, everybody. Well, I'll tell you, when I was writing Your Soul's Plan, my first book, I started uh, not that long after the session with the medium in 2003, and it took three years on a full-time basis. And during that three-year period, I told very few people the subject matter of the book. And the reason I, I didn't tell most people is because of what you just said. I was concerned about the reaction I would get. And the analogy I was using in my own mind when I thought about this, I thought, you know, the book is like a sapling, a very young and fragile tree. And if I talk to people now while it's young and fragile, they may say things that undermine my confidence in what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So the best thing I can do is let the sapling grow into a mature, strong tree and then start talking publicly about it. Because at that point, it's not going to matter what anybody says. And I think I made the right decision in handling it that way. Beautiful, yeah. Very nice. And it inspires me to know that, you know, none of us are alone. Whatever our blueprint is, you know, we that's what we, we agreed to, and it's our soul's mission. So, um, you know, I think we're constantly being guided if we, like you say, can get quiet and lean in to what we're really here to do. So I'm so glad that you listen to your, you know, your your nudges and the whispers coming from your soul. So, um, so where did it go from there, Rob? Well, after I came into contact with the mediums and channels I wanted to work with, uh, we started researching people's pre-birth plans, and that happened again over a three-year period for your soul's plan, and then uh, over a five-year period for your soul's gift. And the work just continued to evolve over the years. Uh, you know, at first when the books came out, uh, I just gave a two-hour talk about pre-birth planning. That has now morphed into a weekend workshop uh, like the one in Vancouver that mm -hmm. you mentioned. And so the, the workshop consists of the two-hour talk. Uh, but then we do this exercise I call the Divine Virtues Exercise, which gives you insight into the qualities you sought to cultivate mm -hmm. in this lifetime. And your desire to cultivate those qualities is one of the main reasons you planned your biggest challenges. You were hoping they would come out of those experiences. And then we do two group regressions. One is to contact a deceased loved one. And if you make contact, and if the form of contact is verbal, you can ask that person any questions you have about your life plan with them. And then the highlight of the workshop, uh, the central event, so to speak, is a group between lives regression in which people talk to the Council of Elders. The Council consists of the very wise, loving, highly evolved beings who oversee reincarnation on Earth, and they know everything about everybody's life plan. So if somebody gets in front of the Council, this is potentially a transformative experience, because if it's for your highest good to have your questions answered, you'll get the answers. And sometimes people come out of those sessions and they say, you know what, I don't have any more questions about my life plan, they answered everything I asked. The other thing that, that people often say about their meeting with the council, they exclaim about uh, how joyous it was to talk to beings who they could sense, love them unconditionally, mm -hmm. and also know everything about them, and yet have absolutely no judgment of them. That's an experience that the average person just doesn't have on the earth plane mm -hmm. in an average lifetime. But when you go in front of the council, you will be very much aware that they know everything that you have done, quote unquote, wrong in your life, that you judge yourself for, but they have no judgment of you, absolutely none at all. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. 
Yeah, that's uh, that's quite a that's kind of a fantasy to imagine everybody feeling that amount of love on the planet. Like it just sort of um, it it feels like a fantasy to me. So uh, if if each person that's on the planet felt that deep love, this would be a completely different uh, environment. It would be, and I think we're headed there, slowly, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think eventually we'll get there. Mm -hmm. Nice. And I can see, you know, I love the, the tie-in from the lifetimes that you were shown, you know, about Atlantis, and, you know, it, it, there's a theme there, right, where, you know, and, and of course the Germ lifetime in Germany, it, it's, it's like you're picking up the ball in, in, in the same theme, but you're doing it differently. It's like you get you get a do-over. Yeah, and that's very much what a lot of life plans are about. You know, when you have your pre-birth planning session, you talk with your guides about your experiences in your past lives and what went well and areas where you feel you could have done better or would like to do better. And then, uh, if assuming there are areas where you feel you could do better, you're given the opportunity to design whatever kind of life plan you would like mm -hmm. where you get to try again and, mm -hmm. and have a, a do-over, mm -hmm. so to speak. Yeah, yeah and I recently um, ha was working with one of my clients that um, listened to uh, the Proof of Heaven interview series that I recently published in the spring. Uh, your interview, with, you were one of our fabulous um, guest speakers. And she uh, is adopted. She was adopted. And the chapter that you wrote, uh, I'm not sure which book it was in, about adoption, really, really changed her life. Like it was just, you know, it just gave her an extra thread that she could contact her parents energetically. We did a little session where she, you know, we went and we met her parents and she felt their love. She could feel the love being beamed at them. And it was like a door opened for her because of that chapter. And I also have clients that um, have relatives that have committed suicide. So can you talk a little bit about those chapters and maybe you know we'll move into some other topics? Yeah, you know, in regard to adoption, uh, as you probably know, it's, it's very common for someone who has been adopted as a child to feel abandoned and or rejected by the birth parents. And when that person comes into the understanding that they themselves planned this experience and for very good reasons, and that the parents who gave them up are actually doing so out of love, mm -hmm. not because they don't want them, exactly. that is tremendously, tremendously healing. Mm -hmm. uh, adoption is one of those areas where an understanding of pre-birth planning can really make yeah. all the difference. Now, in suicide, oh, and by the way, both of these chapters, Adoption and Suicide, are in the second book, Your Soul's Gift. Okay, right, uh, this one here. That one there. Yes. Now, in regard to suicide, the story in Your Soul's Gift is a woman named Carolyn, whose only child, Cameron, uh, takes his own life shortly after he graduated from high school. He had been suffering from a lot of anxiety and depression, and he actually hung himself in Carolyn's home. She came home, found him like that, and was the one who had to cut the rope to bring him down. Oh dear. So she and I worked with uh, Pamela Kerbe, who is a channel in the Netherlands, who channels Jesus. And at the start of the session, Cameron comes in, and he talks with his mother about how well he's doing on the other side. He assures her of his great love for her. He talks about how they meet with each other while she's dreaming, while she's asleep at night, uh, and they discuss uh, the suicide in ways that are healing for her. He says that he's working now on the other side to help uh, teens who suicide to make the transition back into spirit. Talks a little bit about the home he's created for himself uh, and what his experience was shortly after he left the body and, and realized that he had taken his own life because it took him a little bit of time to, to figure out that that's what had happened. Right. Uh, then he steps aside, and Jesus comes in. Mm -hmm. And I ask him, is suicide planned before we're born? And he says, well, it's not planned before birth ever as a certainty, but it is often planned as a possibility or a probability 
or occasionally a probability so high as to be almost certain. And he says this was the case with Cameron. Cameron brought into body unhealed energies from past lives with the intention of healing them. And he knew that these energies would cause uh, severe anxiety and severe depression, but he was willing to take that risk because he really wanted to clear these energies. So uh, what we discover as the conversation goes on is that uh, anybody who is suicidal, if they have the slightest bit of willingness or openness to change their mind, spirit knows that and spirit will stage an intervention so such that the suicidal attempt actually never succeeds or even happens. And you know, the intervention can be almost anything. For example, somebody walks by and smiles and the suicidal person mm. feels better and they don't go through with it. Mm. Or a bird flies by and distracts them and they mm. don't go through with that. Occasionally, an angel will actually take a uh, physical form, human form, and physically intervene to prevent the suicide. But the intervention, regardless of what it is, it can only be done if the person has some openness or willingness to change their mind because spirit will not interfere with anybody's free will. So what this means when you think through the implications of it is that every suicide that could have been prevented actually has been prevented. It was prevented. If someone took their own life, it's only because they had absolutely no openness or willingness to change their mind. And that in turn means that if somebody listening to this interview today, if you lost somebody you love to suicide, it means there was literally nothing you could have done to prevent the suicide. Because again, if that person had the slightest openness to change their mind, spirit would know and spirit would stage an intervention. So when I talk in, in my workshops about suicide, I always say to people, take whatever guilt or self-blame you may feel and put it down and step away from it. Mm -hmm. Because there was literally nothing you could have done. Exactly, yeah. And that goes for, um, you know, uh, accidental deaths as well. You know, like uh, someone's driving down the road, next thing you know, you know, there's a, he there's a head-on collision and that person's dead. Or, you know, some calamity, ha like a, you know, for example, you know, I'll tell you a story, and it it's just popped up. It stands out in my mind. There was a, uh, I live on the Sunshine Coast in British Columbia, and it, there's only one highway here. And this um, this man, you know, he was a, a, a father. He was, a, you know, a community, um, you know, in the community as a, uh, you know, very active. And he rode his bike to work every day. Uh, along the highway from Seashell to uh, I think to Gibson's and he always wore a helmet you know he was really diligent about that and this is back in the days you know 20 years ago before you, it wasn't you know wasn't in vogue to be safe on your bike and um, the one day that he did not have a bicycle helmet uh, a deer jumped out from beside the highway he was knocked onto the ground and killed the one day that he didn't have a bike helmet on and if if he would have had a helmet he probably would have you know saved his life so something like that I mean so that would have been in his sole plan yeah I think that the thing that people need to understand about death is that uh, no one dies without consent mm -hmm. now that doesn't necessarily mean consent at the level of the personality mm -hmm. it means consent at the level of the soul but nobody dies without the consent of their own soul. And their own soul is only going to consent to a particular moment of death if it serves the highest and greatest good of all beings. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand that that is very hard to believe and accept if you're in a lot of pain over having lost a loved one. Mm -hmm. But a few years down the road, when hopefully the pain has uh, mitigated somewhat, that understanding is tremendously helpful and tremendously mm -hmm. healing. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I love what you said about for the good of all, right? So, you know, that person might be volunteering to have an early death so that the rest of the family members receive whatever that piece that they needed to receive, however that uh, is part of their plan. Right. And there, there are actually entire chapters in your soul's plan about the pre-birth planning of the death of a loved one and also about the pre-birth planning of accidents. Uh, accidents... You know, as we're talking here, 
they, they're not really accidents. They, there just are no accidents like that. They're things that are planned prior to birth. And most people have uh, multiple, what you could call exit points. And which one you take depends upon the free will decisions you make while you're in body. But regardless of which one you take, it's all part of the pre-birth plan. Mm -hmm. And isn't it interesting if, you know, the soul, uh, the soul knows what the pre-birth plan is. The physical, you know, human part of us forgets what we, what, you know, what we, we don't remember about our divine, you know, perfectness. And yet, if a soul dies suddenly, if a person dies suddenly, it takes them a while to recalibrate, even knowing that they've passed. And that, so it's that, kind of like, you know, the, 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 there's a, a, an integration period for that physicalness to come back to remember. Yeah, that's very much my understanding as well. Uh, to come back, for example, to Cameron, the person who took his own life, uh, you know, when he talks about that in the channeling session we did with him, he talks about how he was in a gray area. He just didn't see anything around him except grayness on all sides. And then uh, he saw his guides. And he talks about how fortunate he was to start to see them because he could have been in that gray zone for a much longer time, and I say time in quotes, they don't have linear time there, but he saw his guides fairly quickly and then followed them out of the gray area and into the light. Um, that doesn't always happen quite that quickly. Mm -hmm. There is this recalibration period, as you're saying. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even going even bigger and more transpersonal about all of this, all of the people that are, their stories are in your books those people, the examples of them and how they passed or how you discovered through the, the loved ones that had sessions with you, that's also part of their soul. Like their soul's um, agreement was to be ambassadors through their story. Like as Cameron, Cameron's uh, fulfilling his journey of spreading the word to help uh, people on the planet that are considering suicide Plus, he's helping the, 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 the ones that come over that have committed suicide. So he's, he's getting a double whammy uh, blessing from being in your book. Yeah, all of this is, is very much coordinated pre-birth. For example, uh, one of the stories in the accidents chapter in Your Soul's Plan is a woman named Christina who's blown up in a bomb explosion. And in working with uh, one of the mediums, we went into her pre-birth plan session and I was shocked, astonished to see that I was in her pre-birth planning session, and she and I are talking about how she's going to share her story <laughs> in one of my books. Yeah, I got and the shivers on that one. <laughs> I mean, that that was a startling development, um, but this is how it works. Mm. So maybe you and I had a little conversation in between lifetimes. It's certainly possible. <laughs> Um, so where, where do we go from here? So uh, I love that you, you outlined um, what is going to happen in the two-day workshop um, and you're going on a tour. You're, you know, I, I looked at your itinerary. Could, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so uh, on July 19th, I'll be speaking uh, in Nanaimo and that's um, a one to two hour talk about pre-birth planning. Uh, and by the way, all of these events are on the events page of my website, at yoursoulsplan.com. Uh, on August 2nd, I'll be in Parksville on Vancouver Island, giving another talk about pre-birth planning. And then on August 16th, Banyan Books in Vancouver, another talk about pre-birth planning. The workshop uh, will be the weekend of September 8th and 9th. Now on that Friday night, September 7th, there will be a, a public talk about pre-birth planning. And people who attend that, who then decide they want to be part of the workshop, they can sign up at that talk. Uh, the workshop itself will be September 8th and 9th. Uh, so that's the um, British Columbia tour. Yes, and uh, I just want to make a side note here about any of our neighbors across the border. You know, um, this is really reasonably priced because, you know, if you're coming from the States and you come up to Canada, you, you, you get an automatic discount and, um, you know, people can go to your website and look at the, the, the dates and, um, and, and have their own experience. And I'm really excited for, for September. You know, I, I, I'm also going to attend the um, 
Afterlife Symposium in Scottsdale. So September's a really fun month for me, and I know that you've done some work with uh, with uh, the uh, AREI um, symposium people. So it's 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 exponential, you know. If all of, when all of us wake up and start, you know, um, actively co-creating through healing the adversities and come back to evolve back to who we really are because we're all just love and uh, I'm really excited for for what you're bringing forward now I also noticed that you were going to be do going to Spain and um, other countries Do you want to talk about that a little bit sure so uh, following the Vancouver workshop uh, September 15th I'll do a one-day workshop in San Francisco and then the last weekend of October, uh, I'm doing the weekend workshop in Warsaw, Poland. And then the first three weekends of November, uh, it will be in Barcelona, Spain, and then Bilbao, and then in Madrid. Wow, that's fabulous. So, um, well, I'm excited for uh, new people to hear about you, Rob. And I'm also excited for those that already follow you to be even more inspired about their soul's mission and um, do you have anything that you want to add to our conversation or any other uh, chapters you want to share about? Well I think that the one thought I would most like to emphasize and leave people with as the take-home message so to speak is just to be aware of your great courage in coming here. Mm -hmm. You know it's my understanding that Earth is not literally the most difficult place to have an incarnation but it is considered one of the most difficult. And there are many, many beings who think about having an incarnation on Earth and, as I understand it, don't have the courage to follow up on that. But anybody listening to this interview had the courage to come here, had the courage to come into body. And I think so often we're, we're just so aware of our faults, what we consider to be our faults, our weaknesses, even our lack of courage. The simple fact that you're on Earth now, at this time of the shift in consciousness, uh, makes you among the most courageous beings in the universe. So recognize that and honor yourself for that. Mm, very nicely said. Thank you. Yes, I think we really are brave. And uh, some of us might even wish that we were the ones that weren't so brave and decided to not come to, <laughs> come to this mission. <laughs> um, okay, Rob, well, listen, I'm just so happy to um, help you support your soul's mission and uh, these books are amazing so hopefully people will go to your website your do you want to repeat your website again rob yoursoulsplan.com beautifully thank you so much for being here with us today rob and I look forward to meeting you in person in september i'll and, see you there oh yeah Thanks. i'll be Bye. there with bells on and uh, for those of you that would like to um, follow what I'm up to, you can go to my website, danalouisewilliams.com. And if you haven't already downloaded a free copy of Reparent Your Inner Child Using EFT, it's a little 30-page jewel that will help you um, get in touch with your inner child, which is also lined up with your soul's mission. And um, I'd love to hear from you. And thank you so much for being here with us. Bye for now.